It's fall 2020 and PS5 is mere weeks away. It's a sensible time then for the bleeding edge gamer to join the teeming masses in selling up their prized PS4s in exchange for a deposit on their latest and greatest tech. Well, that's all very nice, but where's the tech YouTuber content in that? My name's not important. At the time of writing, UK eBay prices on basic working PS4 consoles range from £140 to £150, depending on condition and age. So for this budget PC challenge, I'm going to aim to build a PC for about that price. And yes, I mean build a PC, not buy a pre-built and slap a graphics card in it. Because, while that's a totally practical idea and something you should definitely consider doing yourself, that's been done before, and there's no real fun in that for me. Starting off then with the processor, and although I'd ideally like to keep this somewhat competitive with a PS4 on a spec-for-spec -spec basis, I had to cut some corners, so rather than looking at something with 8 threads like an i7 or an A... Excuse me, an a AMD bulldozer, I stuck with this handsome little Xeon E3 1220 with four mighty Sandy Bridge cores for the princely sum of 12 British pounds and 50 pence. There seems to be a few sellers on eBay at the moment selling off H61 motherboards for reasonable prices, and I picked up this Gigabyte Micro ATX model for just £30 after missing out on a £25 MSI. Along with the second cheapest branded CPU cooler I could find, plus a cheap 500GB hard drive and 8GB of DDR3, I've got myself a solid PC platform to build on for just about £65. The best power supply I could find within budget was this 400 watt effort from Aerocool, which, while only a small step above your average unbranded fire hazards, is at least 80 plus rated and has a PCIe connector. In truth, if I'd had any sense, I'd have spent an extra £5 or so on a 500 watt model that would have opened up my graphics card's options further, but hindsight's 2020 after all. For a case, I scavenged the generic no frills chassis from the PC in my last trading in video, which I've since rehoused in a slightly more elegant tempered glass case of emotion. I valued this beater of a case at about £15. All in all, by my calculations, we should be up to about £115 so far, and while I could conceivably game on this thanks to the integrated HD graphics, I've already got videos on gaming with a much newer version of Intel's iGPU, and I've only got so much tolerance for low-spec gaming. Besides, a hypothetical gamer jumping ship from PS4 to PC wouldn't want a system bad enough to make them regret that decision, and we still have some budget remaining. After a trip to the sex shop, I came back with a smile on my face and an NVIDIA GTX 660 for just £35. Uh, yes, I checked, it is definitely a GTX 660 with a GK106 GPU, even though the cooler is a dead ringer for those found on dodgy wish.com knockoffs. Finally, a word on the operating system. As was pointed out in the comments of my last build, yes, I have comments now, uh, I didn't include the price of Windows in my budget. In the case of both my previous build and this one, I struck lucky, as both motherboards had come from systems with activated Windows licenses. If, however, you aren't so fortunate, Windows 10 is available for free, asterisk. It's possible to install and use almost uninhibited, with only the beating heart of darkness glaring at you from the corner of the desktop, reminding you of your unpaid debt. I've yet to hear of a real downside or consequence to using an unactivated Windows 10 license, and the legality of using, say, cheap eBay keys is still being debated by legal experts across the comments sections of the internet. I'm not going to pretend my little channel is going to answer the question once and for all, and just kind of breeze on past it. Of course, now I've blown my load on the hardware, there's no room left in the budget for games. Instead of thinking on my mistakes and better allocating my budget, I'm instead going to try out some of the finest free-to-play experiences the PC has to offer. Fortnite is the reason this video took a little longer than I'd expected. My first revision of this system was powered by an i3-2100, 
but I couldn't get an enjoyable gaming experience out of it in Fortnite, with frame rates frequently dropping at crucial moments. Swapping out the £5 CPU pushed my budget right to its limit, but was certainly worth the money. Fortnite's now a buttery smooth experience on this system. Likewise with Fortnite, my early tests with Warzone were not promising, with the i3 resulting in slow texture loading and frequent lag spikes. The Xeon, similar in power to a second gen i5, was more up to the challenge. At lowest possible settings, and at only 1280x720, frame rates were consistent if not high. Apex Legends is a little less demanding than Warzone, at least in terms of rendering and compute power. It's still a heavy burden on hard drive space. We're not quite at the magic 60fps here, but we can get pretty close. I haven't played CSGO in a while, and it seems I'd forgotten that Afterburner doesn't work. Nevertheless, with the built-in frame counter enabled, we can see some frame rates varying from the 70s and 80s and way up into the hundreds, meaning if you really want to spend as much on your monitor as you do on your whole PC, you could conceivably enjoy some high refresh gaming with this setup. I'm actually brand new to Valorant, and I can honestly say I think I see the appeal. This PC is actually overkill, as we could see frame rates pushing 160 without even tweaking the settings that much. Rocket League also runs like a lubricated dream, achieving well over 100 FPS without sacrificing settings too much, once more proving that high frame rates can't compensate for a complete lack of coordination. Although it seems like free-to-play games mostly inhabit the world of competitive action, presumably because there's nothing like an addictive multiplayer experience to inspire gamers to open their wallets, there's occasionally the odd single-player experience to be had for free. Sadly, Genshin Impact suffers from some of the most insufferable plot and dialogue I've experienced recently, spoiling what I'm sure would be an enjoyable game. Although I was only able to run at default settings, this system can comfortably sit at 60fps all day. The 8th console generation was a pretty easy target for anyone building a console killer. Even with fire sale prices on PS4 in the wake of PS5 pre-orders, it's still possible to build something competitive with what would normally be considered pretty obsolete parts. The next gen might be tougher for the PC community to feel smug about. Check out this video for my thoughts on the subject. Let me know if you'd be interested in seeing an Xbox One X killer build down below. While you're down there, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.